Well, I am going to touch on all of the verses that was just read for you, but I am especially interested in verse 14, where Paul says, But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, conduct, note this, conduct not in step with the truth of of the gospel. Now, Paul begins this letter to the Galatian Christians by reminding them that there is only one gospel. He had to write to them because they were abandoning that gospel that he had preached to them, and they were embracing another gospel that someone else had preached to them. And Paul says that's really not a gospel at all. A different gospel is not the gospel at all. The church is built on a single foundation. So there's not gospels, there's one gospel. One single foundation of apostolic doctrine. And this single unified revelation can be summarized in the gospel. And this gospel that Paul preached trumps all other messages. It trumps all other human opinions or agendas. The church has always been and always will be subject to the gospel and to being corrected by that divine revelation. The gospel is not subject to the church. The church is subject to the gospel. Now, even the behavior of an apostle is not above correction by the gospel. And that's what we find Paul recounting to the Galatians in this text. The apostle Paul had to correct the apostle Peter because Peter was not in step with the gospel. And I, I find this rather fascinating to consider. Now, Paul does not recount this confrontation to exalt himself above Peter. He is not trying to embarrass Peter. He's, he's using this as an example to bolster his case to the Galatians. You see, the Galatians needed to pay attention to what Paul had preached to them, to what was revealed in the gospel, because even someone like the apostle Peter was subject to this same message and bound by its truth. So in a sense, Paul is saying, if, if Peter is subject, if the apostle Peter is subject to this gospel and bound by its truth, then you there in Galatians had better listen to the gospel that I preached to you. So I, I don't want anyone to misunderstand that this is somehow a, this message tonight is going to be uh, picking on Peter. Uh, we do have to deal what's with what's in this text and with what Paul said to Peter. Uh, but we're not, uh, and I'll say more about this in a moment, but we're certainly not denigrating Peter at all. Now, to better understand the issues involved behind this passage, we have to go back to a couple of key events in the history of the early church as recorded in the book of Acts. The first event is Peter and Cornelius. This is in Acts chapter 10 and 11. Remember that Peter was called by God to go and preach to Cornelius and his household, and Cornelius was a Gentile. Cornelius was a Gentile. You know, the Jews had separated themselves from the Gentiles, not, not just because they wanted to, but because God had commanded them to be separate, to be a holy nation. And so the, the first Christians were devout Jews, and they didn't see any reason at first not to keep doing many of the things that they had been doing that God had commanded them to do for, for centuries of time. But something had changed. Something was about to change, and it would start with Peter and Cornelius. We may not realize that God's call to preach, for Peter to preach to Cornelius was a revolutionary event. This literally changed the course of human history, Peter going to preach to this man and his household. Now, God prepared both Cornelius and Peter beforehand. Both men received visions beforehand. Cornelius received a vision of an angel that told him to send to Joppa for a man named Simon Peter. And 
Peter had to be prepared by the Lord to go to Cornelius as well. And Peter received a vision, you recall, of a giant sheet that was let down out of heaven. It was filled with all kinds of animals. And Peter was invited by a voice to kill and eat some meat. He was hungry. He'd gone up on the roof of the house. And that's when he saw this vision. And Peter refused because Peter said, I've never touched any unclean animal. There were animals, you know, in the law of Moses. God said, these are clean, these are unclean. You can eat these animals, you can't eat these animals. And Peter said, I've never, ever have I eaten anything that that is is unclean. And so finally the voice said this to Peter in Acts 10, 15, What God has made clean, do not call common. And it was immediately after that, there was a knock at the door, and there were the men from Cornelius, right after Peter had seen this vision. And Peter picked up on what God was trying to tell him. He learned from this vision because he went with, with these men to Cornelius' house, and here's what he said to them, Acts 10, 28. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew like me to associate or to visit anyone of another nation like you, but God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Now, clearly, this vision of the sheet let down from heaven was about more than just food. It was also to be applied to people. And Peter got it. Peter saw that immediately. So Peter preached the gospel to Cornelius. You remember that after he preached Christ to this Gentile household, the Holy Spirit came on them. It actually says the Holy Spirit fell on them. And this was a very important event for Peter and the other Jews with him to witness. There were some other Jews that were with Peter when they went to Cornelius' house. And here's what it says in Acts 10, 45. And the believers from among the circumcised, that's very important, notice that, the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. This was like a Gentile Pentecost. God proved visibly to these Jewish believers that he had accepted Gentiles. You don't get the Holy Spirit unless God accepts you. Now, Peter's going to get some backlash for this. He's called on the carpet back in Jerusalem. Acts 11, verses 2 and 3. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, note this, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Now, at this point, Peter stood up to these men, and he stood by what he knew the Lord had revealed to him. He said to them in Acts eleven seventeen, 17, if then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us, that's speaking of the gift of the Holy Spirit, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? In other words, Peter is saying, if God accepted these people, who am I not to accept these people? So Peter got it. At this point, he got it. Now, this issue did not go away. Because the Apostle Paul comes on the scene, and he has been preaching and establishing churches out in the Gentile world. Now, one family of Gentiles is perhaps tolerable but not a whole movement of Gentile churches. Before too long, this is what the Jewish Christians, these, these, this circumcision party, they had to have been thinking like this. Before too long, these Gentiles are going to outnumber us. There's a lot more Gentiles than there are Jews. And then, then what's going to become of Christianity in the church? And it's, that's the paranoia of all bigotry and prejudice right up to our times. Amen. People think this way. What if some new people come into our group, some people that aren't, aren't like us? We're going to lose control of this thing. Then what's going to happen to our, to our group, you know? What are we going to do with these Gentiles coming into the church? Acts 15.1, some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So here's this certain faction within the Jew- Jerusalem church, these Jews were going out, coming, kind of following Paul around through the Gentile regions, telling them, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to keep the law if you want to be saved. So it's, it's almost as if they were saying, we can't keep these people out completely, but we can at least clean them up a little. Let's clean these people up a little. We, we may not be able to keep the Gentiles out, but 
We're going to make them obey the law. And so the first ecumenical council of the church convened in Jerusalem to debate this issue. And Peter went first. He spoke first, giving a, re, or excuse me, Paul went first, giving a report of what the Lord was doing among the Gentiles through his ministry. That included the Galatians. That included the Galatians. And then this circumcision group was still there. Acts 15, 5. Some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. See, it's the same, it's the same thing, the same group of people. Now notice that these men who said these things were themselves Christians. This is not unbelieving Jews speaking. These are, these are Jewish Christians within the church who are saying these Gentiles need to be circumcised, they need to keep the law. Now Peter takes his turn at the Jerusalem council. Acts 15, verses 7 through 11. Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's talking about Cornelius. Mm -hmm. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and he made no distinction between us and them. Notice that. Mm -hmm. he, made, he, God, made no distinction between us Jews and them Gentiles, having cleansed their hearts by faith. By faith. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test? By placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Beautiful, Peter. That's beautiful. Peter's right on target. He's in perfect agreement with Paul. He's standing up to these legalists. Something happened. Something happened to Peter after this. Peter lapsed back into the old ways. He had been participating in full fellowship with the Gentile Christians, but this circumcision group was still lurking in the background, still clinging to their position, and they somehow convinced Peter to withdraw from full fellowship with the Gentiles. Again, I don't want to be too hard on Peter here. I don't think Peter personally changed his mind about the Gentiles. I don't think Peter abandoned the gospel himself, at least not intellectually, but his behavior toward the Gentile believers was out of step, Paul says, with the gospel. And Paul called him on it publicly. In front of them all, the text says, publicly. Now, some biblical scholars have taken the position that this encounter between Peter and Paul was symptomatic of a deep division in the early church between these two men. Uh, they, they, it's actually been said that there was a, a Peter church and a Paul church. There were people who followed Peter and there were people who followed Paul, but there's no evidence That's right. that Peter and Paul were ever divided either before or after this brief confrontation. I think Peter immediately made the necessary correction. And the unity of the church was intact. So again, please don't misunderstand me. I am not picking on Peter. But we need to learn some things from this little encounter between Paul and Peter. Now, the issue here is between Peter and Paul is not primarily a doctrinal issue. Yeah. Peter was not in danger of becoming a heretic or denying the basic tenets of the faith. The problem was with Peter's orthoproxy, not his orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is right belief. Orthoproxy is right practice. Praxis. Practice. This was about Peter's practice. Peter was not denying the gospel with his lips, but his actions were in opposition to the gospel. You see, there is a kind of behavior that is out of step with the gospel. Something made Peter change his walk or his conduct so that he was no longer walking in step with the gospel. Now, if this happened to Peter, could it not happen to any of us today? So I want to ask this question tonight. What caused Peter to get out of step with the gospel? And I think all of the clues are right here in this passage. First of all, fear. 
fear is out of step with the gospel. It says in verse 12, when they came, that is these certain men from James, those are, the, those are these, the circumcision group. It says he drew back and separated himself, fearing, fearing the circumcision party. Fear is out of step with the gospel. Peter was afraid of the men from the circumcision party. In other words, it wasn't he was afraid they were going to beat him up. It wasn't that kind of fear. It was more like intimidation. Peter was intimidated by them for some reason, and intimidation is a form of fear. I don't know why Peter was intimidated by these men. Uh, perhaps Peter thought that offending them would undermine his ministry, because Peter might have been thinking, you know, I'm the apostle to the Jews, Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. If I make all the Jews upset with me, how am I going to fulfill my ministry? I, I don't know if that's what Peter was thinking or not. That's just conjecture. We don't know why Peter was afraid, but we do know that we are warned in Scripture not to fear men. And I think I know why we often become intimidated by other people. First of all, we may just be afraid of conflict. And so to keep the peace or some semblance of peace, we compromise what we know to be true. And some people will rationalize this and say, well, you know, we're supposed to be peacemakers. Aren't we supposed to be peacemakers? We're, we're supposed to get along, you know. And people, because they're afraid of conflict, they will compromise what they know to be true. Secondly, we may be overly concerned about our reputation or what people think about us. I'm, I'm talking here about why we're intimidated by other people. We're, we're concerned about what if they think I'm a nutcase? What if they think I'm, you know, eh, a little off? I don't want people to think I'm a weirdo. You know, I want people to think, I want people to like me, you know. And that seems very innocent. It even seems legitimate sometimes, but it can also mask a love for the praise of men. Remember in John 12, John says they, they wouldn't confess Christ because they, they knew they'd be put out of the synagogue because they love the praise of men more than the, more than the glory of God. Many people will deny God in order to be accepted by other people. That's a serious sin, brethren. That's, that's not a small matter at all. That, that can lead you to he, straight to hell if it's carried far, far enough. Thirdly, we may be intimidated by men because we don't know how to defend the truth and argue our position effectively. Someone may bring a really weighty argument and just, we just kind of go, uh, I don't know what to say to that. You know? Maybe, I don't know, maybe these... these these people in the circumcision group, they were Pharisees. They probably could argue pretty good. I'm not, I, don't know if it, I don't know if that's what it was. Peter thought, I, just, I don't know what I'm going to say to these men. I don't have a good biblical argument. I can just tell them what I saw, you know. Sometimes that doesn't seem like a very powerful argument. We can have the same problem where we, we, we don't know exactly how to defend our position, defend the truth, and we know something is wrong, but we don't know why, and so we don't know what to say, and so just go along with it. I know that's wrong, but I don't know what to say. I just I guess I'll just go along. Fourthly, we may compromise the truth in order to maintain our position or status in the group. This kind of goes back to being concerned about our reputation, but some of the most evil deeds in the history of mankind have been done because people wanted to be accepted by their peers. This is not an innocent thing at all. This is a very dangerous sin and temptation. We may be intimidated by people we deem to be important and worthy of honor. You know, if, if there's somebody I think is well, that person's, you know, they've really, they're, they're really smart, they're really spiritual, they're really godly. Uh, they, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of intimidated by that person. But sometimes the people we choose to honor are not really worthy of honor. I don't think that, I don't think that Peter should have given a lot of honor to these men. He was intimidated by the circumcision group. I, I don't think he should have thought so highly about them as apparently he did at this point. There are some people whose opinion of us should simply not carry very much weight. Now, there are some people in my life, I care very much what they think about me and my actions. There are some other people, maybe this sounds really arrogant, I don't know, but I, I frankly don't really care what they think about me. 
They're just not very high in the kingdom. Well, you, you get what I'm saying. And sometimes, finally, we are afraid because we are thinking only of ourselves instead of the kingdom of God. We tend to live in the moment instead of thinking of the bigger picture. Now, I'm not saying Peter did all those things. I don't know why Peter did this. We're not told why he did it. I'm just unpacking why we might do the same thing that Peter did. Now, the gospel is the remedy for fear. When we are tempted to fear man, we should remember that God is infinitely greater than man, and God is the one we should fear. Jesus said, don't fear the him that can kill the body, and after that they can't do anything else. Don't fear man. Fear God. Man is nothing next to the glory of God. Fear of man will make us weak. The fear of God will make us invincible. If God be for us, who can be against us? And where do we learn that, by the way? Where do we learn that God is for us? We learn that in the gospel. That's where we learn that God is for us, in the gospel. The, the gospel is the source of our confidence, and the gospel will drive out our fear. So if we're afraid of men, it's because our faith in the gospel is weak. You know, our sun is a powerful source of light. It's many times larger than the earth itself. But to block out the light of the sun, all you have to do is shut your eyes. And you won't be able to see its glory. The same is true of the light of the gospel and unbelief. If we close our eyes in unbelief, we won't be able to see the glory of the gospel and we will walk in darkness and in fear. It's unfortunate that it is still possible for believers to have times of weak faith. Having weak faith, by the way, is not the same as having no faith. But we are capable of highs and lows in our Christian walk. Peter himself is an excellent illustration of this. I'm not picking on Peter. I'm just, this is all in the scriptures. Remember, Peter walked on water, then he began to sink. Peter said, I'll follow you, Jesus, even if I have to die for you. And that same night, he denied he even knew Christ when pressed by a little servant girl. Peter preached on Pentecost, opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, but then in this account he withdrew from fellowship with the Gentiles when pressed by the circumcision group. Now, we are capable of these extremes if our faith happens to be weak. Faith, you see, is dynamic. It's not static. Faith is not something you get, and once you've got it, you've got it. That's not how faith works. We need to continue to grow in grace and in our knowledge of the gospel. Peter himself said that in 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in grace, he said, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Keep growing. When we make mistakes, we repent. That's what Peter did. In fact, Peter was very good at that. Peter was very good at saying, oh, that was wrong, and he did an about face. He always recovered. The ministry of the body of Christ is to help us be strong in faith and to recognize where and when we have failed to live by faith. And that's why I trust that as soon as Peter heard what Paul said, Peter made the correction. That's the kind of man Peter was. So again, I'm not picking on Peter tonight, but we we are learning from from Peter. So, So fear is out of step with the gospel. Secondly, favoritism is out of step with the gospel. Favoritism. Peter was practicing something the Bible calls favoritism by withdrawing from fellowship with the Gentiles in favor of his Jewish brethren. There was no other legitimate reason for Peter not to fellowship with the Gentiles other than the fact that they were Gentiles. These were brethren. And Peter refused to fellowship with them based purely on their race and nationality. What does it mean to show favoritism? Favoritism means to judge a person based purely on external criteria. The Greek word is to literally regard the face. To regard the face. To look at someone externally. You've heard it before. You can't judge a book by its cover. You can't judge a person, the value of a person, based on their appearance, their race, their age, their gender, their nationality, the way they dress, or how much money they have. That's favoritism if you do. Now, God does not show favoritism. And Peter had learned this previously when he was called to preach the gospel to Cornelius. Here's what Peter said in Acts 10, 34 and 35. Truly, I understand 
that God shows no partiality or favoritism. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. God does not show favoritism. God looks at the heart, not at the outward appearance of a person. That's 1 Samuel 16, 7. Remember, that was when Samuel went to anoint David, and he kept seeing all of David's big, tall, handsome older brother. Surely this is the one. I mean, look how tall he is. And God said, no. They, he, God, man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Now, this seems, what I'm, what I'm saying here seems to contradict the fact that God clearly chose and favored Israel over other nations. But there were some of the people of Israel who were rejected because of unbelief. Not all who are descended physically from Israel actually belong to the people of God. So it's absolutely true. God does not show favoritism. And since God does not show favoritism, God's people should not so show favoritism either. This is James 2, verses 1 to 4. My brothers, show no partiality or favoritism as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So here's a, here's a guy come in. He's obviously wealthy. He's, all, he's dressed to kill, you know. And Oh, wow, that's the kind of guy we want in our church. He'll probably tithe a lot. And some poor guy comes in off the street and everybody ignores him. See, that's favoritism. It's favoritism. You see, God accepts people on the basis of faith. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But with faith, you do please God, see. So God accepts people on the basis of faith and no other criteria. God may even accept people that we don't particularly like. But who are you to accept people, to reject people that God has accepted? Isn't that how Peter reasoned? When he reported back to the Jerusalem church, he said, well, God accepted him. Who was I to stand in the way of God? If you refuse to accept the people that God, if you choose to reject the people that God has accepted, you're fighting God. Who are we to reject people that God has accepted? You know, learning to accept people can be very difficult. It's easier to just judge and reject people. We tend to judge people externally based on criteria that are either personal preferences or cultural baggage rather than biblical absolutes. You see, the, the scripture talks about things that transcend opinions, that transcend culture. And so we have no right to apply our personal preferences or our cultural baggage above the absolute truth of the word of God. Amen. And so we have no right to withdraw from fellowship with brethren based on favoritism. But old ways of thinking die hard. Mm -hmm. And there are things that we have to unlearn when we learn the gospel. Now, now, let me add this caveat. We do have to be able to make a distinction between brethren and false brethren. Right. I'm not saying accept everyone. That's not what I'm saying. We should not fellowship, for example, with a person who claims to be a Christian yet is immoral. Mm -hmm. Paul said that to the Corinthians. Don't even eat with a person like that. Or someone who embraces and teaches false doctrine. Don't welcome that kind of person into your home. Into your home. See. However, there may be people out there who are brethren, yet they're in error and they need correction. That was, that was Peter's case here. We should not be looking for any and every reason to reject people. God does not do that and he or he would have already rejected all of us long ago. Accepting brethren may mean that we have to accept people that we disagree with on disputable matters. That's what the whole 14th chapter of Romans is about. One guy says, well, I can eat, I can eat pork. Another guy says, I, I can't eat pork. See, this is a disputable matter. Is it a sin to eat pork? No. For some people it is. So are you going to, are you going to refuse to fellowship with everybody who doesn't eat pork or with everybody who does? See, that's a disputable matter. Paul says, accept one another as Christ has accepted you. Don't divide over these matters of eating and drinking. Yeah. 
If we are not willing to accept people that we disagree with on disputable matters, and by the way, the gospel is not one of those things. I'm not saying that people who reject the gospel, we should accept them anyway as brethren. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about there are disputable matters. Matters of opinion. Matters of culture. Matters of taste. Personal preference. You don't divide over those things. If we do, we are in danger of drawing our circle of fellowship smaller and smaller and tighter and tighter, which is what cults do. Don't either accept or reject whole groups of people as if everyone is the same because of the group they belong to. That's another form of favoritism. That's also what we call sectarianism. If you don't like it when people judge and reject you before they even know you, then don't do that to other people. Practice the golden rule. Do you like it when people reject you? Don't even know you. Well, I heard you're a part of that group over there. They don't even know who you are. If you don't like it when people do that to you, don't do it to other people. Divisions begin with an attitude problem. That can be traced back to pride. You see, I feel justified in rejecting the people that I feel are inferior to me. Remember that God has the final word on who is in and out of his kingdom, not us. The tax collectors and prostitutes got in while the Pharisees stood outside the door. And who would have thought that any Gentiles would ever be included in the family of God? In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, You... You were aliens, and you were not even a part. You weren't even a people, you Gentiles. You and I got in by grace through faith, and we should extend that same grace to those who also want to enter in and not make it harder for them by showing favoritism. So favoritism is out of step with the gospel. Thirdly, hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is out of step with the gospel. Now, this is is a hard word. But this is exactly what Paul said. Paul said that Peter's behavior was hypocritical, even influencing Barnabas. Now, the interesting thing about that is Barnabas had previously been known for accepting people. Who was it that brought Saul to the other apostles? It was Barnabas. Hypocrisy spreads like a disease in the church. When influential people are hypocritical, it creates a culture of pretense and bad behavior is rewarded instead of shamed. A church infected by hypocrisy becomes something akin to a religious theater where people come to watch a slick production put on by professional actors. Now, who is a hypocrite? We hear this word used pejoratively by people in our culture criticizing Christians and the church, but do we really know what the term hypocrite means? I've heard some people say, well, we're all hypocrites. Well, we all may have behaved hypocritically at some point, but this is a serious sin. It cannot be a part of our lives at all, or you will be condemned. What is hypocrisy? First, hypocrisy means to be insincere. It means to act differently from how you really feel or believe. In this case, Peter knew there was nothing wrong with eating with the Gentiles, yet he withdrew anyway. I have to think Peter knew... He he was eating with the Gentiles before. He obviously didn't think there was anything wrong with that. Imagine someone being your friend in one context and then refusing to even sit with you in another context. That's hypocrisy. When you know something is wrong and you do it anyway, that's hypocrisy. You say, I know this is wrong, but I really want to do it. That's hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is taking a... In public, taking a certain position on an issue, but when you're in private, you do something entirely different. That's hypocrisy. Hypocrites live by convenience. They will do what they feel to be personally advantageous to them at the time. Religion, hypocritical religion, is something that could be turned off or on when it is convenient to do so. So I feel like being a Christian now... But in this group, in this context, uh, don't feel like being a Christian in this context. That's hypocritical. Hypocrites seem especially good at avoiding suffering for what they believe. If it's going to cost me anything, count me out. That's a hypocrite. I'll take a stand if, 
you know, if it's somehow advantageous, but if it's, if it's going to cause me any pain, I'm out of there. Now, Jesus condemned hypocrisy in the strongest of terms. Read the Sermon on the Mount. Most of the Sermon on the Mount is about hypocrisy. Don't do your acts of righteousness for other men to see. You won't receive any reward from your Father who's in heaven. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus condemns the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers of the law for their hypocrisy. It seems to me that God hates religious sin most of all. I know that because Jesus was angry with the Pharisees, but he was not angry with the woman at the well, even though she'd had five husbands. Jesus was not angry at the woman caught in adultery. But Jesus did make a whip of cords and drive out the money changers in the temple. God hates hypocrisy. Why do people become hypocrites? The main source of hypocrisy seems to be trying to please other people. We selfishly want to look good and have others praise us, even if we have to compromise, even if we have to lie to get approval. And in extreme cases, if this is not repented of, this is a form of idolatry. Yes, amen. You see, our beliefs and our actions have to match. If these do not match, then we may not really believe what we say we believe. Or we may have embraced another gospel. Or we may be compromising what we believe because of some outside influence. We may need to confess our sin and come into the light. God's people are to be truth tellers, not liars. Another word for a hypocrite is a liar. Hypocrisy is the most common reason people give for avoiding the church today. Christians publicly condemn sin, yet the church is filled with sin, even among the leadership. Many churches seem to have ulterior motives like money and are not genuinely interested in the welfare of people. And people pick up on that, and that is a form of hypocrisy. You see, we are the only Jesus people in the world can see. People have a right. I say people have a right to inspect the lives of professed believers to see if our lifestyle matches the claims we make. And people would not be as quick to dismiss the truth of the gospel if our lives adorned the doctrine, Titus 2 and verse 10. Amen. So hypocrisy is out of step with the gospel. Finally, legalism. Legalism is out of step with the gospel. The heart of the problem with Peter's behavior was that it was based on a legalistic approach to God being propagated by the circumcision group. Even though the law of Moses was given by revelation of God and was to be obeyed, no one was made righteous by keeping the law. The law was given to teach us about sin and our need for an imputed righteousness that comes through faith. That's the major thrust, by the way, of Paul's letter to the Galatians in chapters 3 and 4. How do we identify legalism? I personally don't think legalism is as easy to identify as people think it is. This can be a very subtle error. In fact, legalism is usually based on the Bible. Some of the most legalistic people use the Bible the most. Yet their conclusions are wrong because their starting point is wrong. In other words, legalists have the wrong hermeneutic. Let me give you an example. This right here in this context. God had commanded circumcision. That's in the Bible. So all the, all the legalists had to do was say, hey, it's in there. God told Abraham to be circumcised. God said to the law of Moses, circumcise your children on the eighth day. It's in the Bible. God commanded many other things too. If we are legalists, we could also conclude that all the food laws are still in force. It's in there. When did God ever take those things out? Some people make, this, some people make that uh, argument. What about all the feasts? When does it say we're free not to do that? The legalists in the early church thought this meant that God received people on the basis of doing these things. That's where they went wrong. The gospel said that God accepts people on the basis of faith and nothing else. Here are some characteristics of legalism and legalists. First, legalism is an approach to God that believes we can be righteous based on what we do. All religion tends toward legalism and attempting to establish our own righteousness before God. Legalists actually add to the gospel. They put additional burdens on people, 
That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verse 4. He says, they put heavy burdens on people, but they won't lift a finger to help. The gospel sets us free, but legalism enslaves. In fact, Paul went so far as to say in Galatians 3.10, if you want to be under the law, he says, you're under a curse. You're in bondage. You're a slave. You're like Hagar, not Sarah. You're like Ishmael, not Isaac. Legalists are never content to keep their views to themselves. They always want to bind their additional requirements on other people while condemning anyone who does not meet their standards. So it's one thing to say, I feel like I can't eat pork. It's another thing to say, none of you can either. And if you do, you're not a Christian. See the difference between those things? See, but a legalist will say, this is how I feel. And all of you have to feel the same way. And if you don't, I'm not going to fellowship with you. Now, all of us are very familiar with this in our, in, because we come, most of us come from a Christian church background. And there are folks in our tradition that say, we don't think you should ever use an instrument. And if you do, we're not going to fellowship with you. So we, we know about this. Legalism always leads to arrogance. But anyone who knows the gospel cannot be proud because we know we are not justified by our own works. The gospel calls us to trust in the work of God, not in our works. A Christian does good works, but does not trust in those works for justification. You see, legalism is opposed to faith. Legalism is not faith. We're justified like Abraham was justified by faith in the promise of God. I think Genesis 15, 6 is one of the most important verses in the Bible. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. That's Genesis 15, 6. Paul says in Galatians 3, 9, God preached the gospel to Abraham. That was the promise God gave in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, and in other places. I'll bless you. He said, I'm going to bless the whole world through your seed. And by the way, that was many years before the law was even given. The promise came first. And in Paul's way of thinking, that means the promise is superior to the law. The circumcision group had neglected to consider the fact that Abraham was already justified by faith before he was circumcised. Circumcision was the sign and seal of God's covenant, but could not have been the basis for his justification. That's Paul's powerful reasoning in Romans 4, 9 to 12. When was was Abraham justified? Was it... Was it after he was circumcised? No, it was, it was before. So circumcision could not have been the basis for his justification. He was already declared righteous. That's powerful. That's a powerful argument, by the way. If we have Abraham's faith, then we are his children and are blessed like Abraham. The gospel is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, which included a blessing for both Jews and Gentiles who have faith in Jesus, who is the seed of Abraham. So we all get in the same way. Through the same message, by the same faith, there are no second-class citizens in the body of Christ. Everyone who has faith in Jesus is accepted, and there are no additional requirements. This means we must also then accept one another without conditions or reservations. If the gospel is compromised, then the very fabric of Christian fellowship also begins to unravel. Let me conclude this message tonight. Peter's behavior in this passage proves that simply embracing the right doctrine intellectually does not mean that our behavior will automatically be right and good. Our behavior could be out of step with the truth of the gospel. Now, if we do find our conduct at variance with the gospel, that does not mean that the gospel is a flawed message or that it encourages and justifies our sin. Being justified by faith does not mean we are free to continue in sin. Instead, we are to walk in the Spirit. Paul says that later in Galatians 5. However, Christians still struggle with the flesh, and that may mean that true believers will sometimes stumble. However, the gospel will teach us how to walk. The gospel will teach us to die to selfish desires through the cross and walk by faith in the Son of God. 
The gospel will teach us how to walk in love, accepting those who have also been accepted by God through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen.